Hello, and welcome to lecture 16 of AMAT 502 at UAlbany. Today, we're going to talk about our first lesson in clustering um, and focusing, of course, on some of the philosophical problems along the way. Let me go ahead and give you a more detailed breakdown of what we're covering today. So I'm going to remind you that in machine learning, we think of there being these two broad branches. Um, one corresponds to supervised learning, and the other corresponds to unsupervised learning. Essentially, supervised learning involves labeled data, whether those labels are continuously varying, like in regression, or whether they're discrete or categorical, like when trying to classify cats or dogs. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, we have to deal with data which needs to sort of speak for itself. It's unlabeled. And clustering is going to be one of our first examples of that. We'll talk about partitional clustering, hierarchical clustering, and of course, talk about some of the philosophical problems with clustering, um, which brings to another ancient Greek paradox known as Sorites paradox. Uh, we'll get into some more modern examples, which involves the MNIST and Fashion MNIST data sets. And of course, because of our train model predict paradigm, we're going to try to always uh, frame some of these tasks as optimization problems. This will lead us finally to the k-means algorithm, um, and we'll describe two implementations. And at the very end, I'll describe uh, one of our first projects where we can talk about how we uh, can analyze or cluster real data. So just remember, machine learning is in some ways a reboot of the scientific method. Um, of course, we have to make observations and uh, formulate hypotheses, but these hypotheses now take the form of models. Um, and then we like to make predictions, but really we don't care about perfect predictions. We just care about, you know, almost perfect predictions. And this is where we get to accuracy. One of the problems with machine learning is that it doesn't shed light into sort of causal mechanisms behind the, how the world works, um, which if you click on this link is something that Noam Chomsky doesn't like. But either way, remember, we have to train, which is the same thing as observation. We have to infer and select a model. And then we're going to predict aspects of future data or test our model on reserved data, which is known as our test data. The four main branches of machine learning go underneath, first, the broader umbrellas of supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, we've already talked about examples of regression and classification. This all deals with labeled data. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, deals with unlabeled data and tries to discover what is called latent structure. Clustering is the most primitive aspect of latent structure. How do we know if things belong together or, or whether they belong in separate categories? That's the essence of clustering. We'll soon talk about dimensionality reduction, which sort of asks, what is the true dimension that underlies um, our data? Again, we've got this beautiful sort of tree-like representation of all the various aspects of supervised and unsupervised learning. So we're finally getting to start in non-supervised learning. And we're going to start, of course, with clustering. Um, there's a really insightful um, survey of some of the uh, really encyclopedic accounts of machine learning written by Kevin Murphy. Um, called Machine Learning, a Probabilistic Perspective. It's a very advanced, so I don't necessarily recommend it if you're new, but if you're looking to become a serious data scientist, you should consider picking it up. Broadly, we have two branches of clustering. So you can think of these as sub-branches underneath clustering. First is partitional clustering. In this case, we're trying to partition um, our, our data into, into certain subsets. Um, now, these don't have to be, uh, uh, the, one of the key things of being uh, partition is that it needs to be exhaustive, meaning everything goes into some, some uh, part of the partition, and it has to be non-overlapping. And so there are lots of examples of this. We're going to be talking about k-means, but there are also things like spectral clustering, Dirichlet processes, and Gaussian mixture models. Um, hierarchical clustering, on the other hand, understands that data can be read at varying scales. Um, and so here we're sort of interested in how things which maybe look far apart when you're zoomed in 
actually look close together as you zoom out. This idea of there being scale to data is really what's important. Um, and some of the things that go into this title are single linkage clustering, uh, which is something that's related to uh, one of the fundamental aspects in topological data analysis. Um, the main data structure with hierarchical clustering is that of a dendrogram, just like a tree of life. Um, and, and here I've got a picture to illustrate these two. So in k-means clustering, which we're going to talk about today, we're given sort of a bunch of data and then we sort of specify ahead of time how many clusters we think there are. In this case, uh, we posit that there are three clusters. We've got some blue, we've got some red, we've got some green. Hierarchical clustering, on the other hand, uh, understands that you can sort of first start off in separate bins, but then those bins merge. Um, so as you move up the tree, um, they have uh, different clusters. So in particular, if we were to slice at this level that I'm indicating with my cursor, we could say that there actually are three clusters. And this is sort of nice because we really do let the data speak for itself. And we try to see over what range is there sort of the, the most persistent number of clusters. All right, so I've already alluded to what's the mathematical definition of clustering, at least when we think of clustering in terms of partitions. So for those of you who haven't taken more advanced uh, sort of pure math classes, let me remind you or tell you what a, uh, what a partition is. So imagine we've got a set and we can think of this as a finite set X. We wanna think of this as our, our raw data. And again, we can think of each of these X I's as actually being sort of the feature vectors associated to some samples. So when we do partitional clustering, which is what we're gonna talk about today, the goal is to partition our set. Mathematically, a partition means that we need to decompose X into a union of sets, which I'll call this C alpha. Alpha is our index for whatever cluster we're looking at. Um, it's Greek letter, but when we write out using numbers, it makes it maybe is a little less scary. So our first goal is we wanna write X as a union of sets. That means X is gonna be equal to the union over over alpha of each of these C alpha. And assuming that alpha, the number of classes is finite, we can think of this as X is the union of one cluster with another cluster, a second cluster on through our kth cluster. Now, again, all this says is that we're writing our set as a union, but we also wanna force another property, namely that whenever we have two different labels for our clusters, we don't want there to be any joint membership. So meaning I can't be both a cluster, an element of cluster one and cluster two, I have to pick one. So whenever our index labels are different, I've asked that those subsets be disjoint, meaning that their intersection is empty, indicated using this empty set sign. All right, so let's step back in time. And again, think about how other people have thought about clustering. So there's a, a relatively famous, but much not nearly as famous as Plato or Aristotle, um, author by the name of Eubilides of Miletus. So he lived in around the fourth century uh, BCE, sort of around the same time as, as Plato and Aristotle. He outlined some of the several famous paradoxes that had sort of essentially been discussed and were still considered unsolved. Um, one of the most famous examples is uh, the paradox of the liar. So if I say um, this sentence is, is false, um, well, if I take that on its face and say that, well, if it's false, then it must be true. But if it's true, then it must be false. I get caught in this sort of logical loop. Um, the one pertinent clustering is called Sorites paradox. Um, and Sorites actually derives from the Greek word for heap. Um, and essentially the paradox goes something like this. So imagine I've got a huge pile, let's call it a heap of sand. Um, it's got a million grains of sand in it. We can all agree colloquially that, you know, if I, if I say that this is certainly a heap, this is certainly a pile of sand. Now, what happens if I remove one grain of sand from that pile? Has I, have I changed its status as a heap, as a pile? Um, 
certainly removing one grain of sand doesn't. Um, but if I'm being very logical and I say that, well, a, a heap includes grains of sand with a million, but it also includes one where it's a million minus one. And then consequently by induction, if I have 999,000 grains and I remove one, it's still a heap. And so if I repeat these hypotheses a million times, then I can conclude that a single grain of sand is also a heap. So you can see here the problem is, is we have some implicit notion that above a certain number, there is uh, a well-defined notion of heap. And then below that, it's not really a heap anymore. But also we agree that whenever we try to set that boundary, uh, removing one doesn't really change its heapness. So how do we cluster the world so that we can think of, well, when we have this many grains of sand, it is a heap and we have fewer than this many, it's not a heap. This might seem like a really sort of abstract paradox, but you know, let's consider uh, perhaps a more pertinent case to our everyday lives. Uh, so in general, you know, imagine uh, I'm looking at this picture of this man here. Would you say he's bald or not? Uh, some would say that he's bald, but some would also say, well, he's still got hair on his head, so he's not bald, he's not truly bald. Um, and so now I can just take the same paradox before with grains of sand. Like how many hairs of, on someone's head uh, are you no longer, are you not bald? And then below what number do you become bald? And in general, you know, if you put some numbers to this, we have people are born with 90,000 to 120,000 hairs in their head. So it depends actually on your hair color and things like this. Uh, now, obviously if I just pluck one hair, I haven't suddenly made a person bald. But if I keep doing this repeatedly, at what phase or what point is there sort of a, a phase transition from, from not bald into bald? Uh, and so then this leads to all sorts of questions. Uh, are our terms uh, inherently vague? Can I give a precise definition of baldness? Uh, uh, or is this something that's sort of a deeper phenomenon in the world? Um, if you have time, you can read more on uh, Sorority's Paradox at the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. So there's sort of more abstruse ancient Greek problem with clustering. And then I've also given you maybe a more pertinent and personal one. You know, I am afraid of going bald one day, um, but so be it. Uh, now, what happens if I get into um, uh, more practical examples that are pertinent to your careers as data scientists? Um, why do we care about uh, clustering uh, if we're thinking about data science? So here's an example that's from this very nice book um, by uh, Gareth James, Daniela Witten, uh, Trevor Hasty, and Robert Tibshirani uh, called Introduction to Statistical Learning. So this is the, a slightly smaller version of a book uh, that's called Elements of Statistical Learning, which is bigger and also yellow. Um, this, is, this book's more grounded in R, um, but it's still, I think, a really good addition to anyone, any data sci aspiring data scientist library. So um, they give this example where they talk about, suppose I want to try to cluster different subsets of a market. Um, so, and I have access to certain measurements, let's say things like the median household income or their occupation, or maybe distance from the nearest urban area. Um, given all these sort of features that I can ascribe to people, um, I'm going to try to perform what's called market segmentation. So I'm trying to partition my market into distinct groups of people that I can try to target towards uh, with the idea that I, I can do a better job if I, if I do specific advertising targeted towards certain markets, um, especially when those markets tend to have more expendable wealth or income. Um, and so the task of performing market segmentation amounts to clustering people in this data set. So we've got sort of a philosophical sand-based one. We've got a hair-based example. Now we've got an economics marketing-based example. Clustering is a really important problem. 
let's keep piling on examples. Um, so this is a data set which every data scientist needs to be aware of. Um, it's called the uh, MNIST data set. And essentially, it just consists of uh, a bunch of handwritten digits. Now, again, this is sort of an interesting task because humans are obviously able to look and then see what number it is, at least most of the time. Sometimes there's some, some ambiguities. Uh, and in fact, there are some in, uh, in here as well. Uh, let's see. Yeah, how do we tell the difference between sevens and ones? Um, what is this, for example? So this is an example that sort of blends between clustering and also a supervised learning problem. You can imagine that we're handed these handwritten images and we're also given the label of what this is actually an eight. But suppose we forgot the labels and uh, we never even knew what um, these these sort of symbols represented. We're aliens visiting from another planet. Um, if I were to just be given all these sort of handwritten scrawls, how would I partition them so that I'd say, oh, these are all representing the same symbol and some of these aren't. This is especially interesting when you look at cases of how people write their fours differently. So here's a four, here's a four, and this is also a four. Here I've got a loop, which makes it closer to a nine than, than a four written like this. Um, so that's one other example to be aware of. But here's another example, which I, I like even more, um, because obviously there's only 10 classes, zero through nine um, for handwritten digits. But suppose you're just given articles of clothing and you're supposed to you know, distinguish uh, what are these different articles of clothing? Um, so what, what, makes a, what makes a dress fundamentally different from a shirt, right? How do we draw the line? Um, once the shirt becomes long enough, does it become a dress? Um, and then similarly with sandals, how do we differentiate sandals from, from shoes or boots? Um, and what makes a purse different from a satchel? So you might ask yourself, are these actually well-defined categories? Um, if you think they are, then, then we should actually be able to actually perform a partition. Like this is a person, that's a satchel, and they're not the same thing. Um, or are our categories inherently vague? Or perhaps our categories emerge as we, as sort of a implicit clustering task that we perform in our brains and in our cultures. Okay, so there we have a lot of examples. Um, so let's get back to some of the math. Um, so I'm gonna use this notion of metric, which we used in our, uh, in our last lecture to, to really get at um, uh, what the notion of clustering is. Uh, you'll remember that I introduced what a metric was in, uh, in lecture 14 when we were talking about uh, K-nearest neighbors, because I needed to talk about nearness. So let's assume our data set is equipped with some uh, metric, or maybe we can be more flexible and just use dissimilarity measures. Dissimilarity measure is just a non-negative symmetric function from zero to infinity. Uh, and we can be inclusive of both of those if we like. Basically, this number, the higher numbers say they're very dissimilar. Uh, lower numbers uh, means they're, they're actually quite similar, very similar. Um, I have a little question here just for you to think about. And remember, go back and review your notes. Uh, what's the difference between a dissimilarity measure and a metric? I'll give you some time to go ahead and pause the video and, and think about that. OK, so continuing. In an ideal world, here's maybe some property that we'd like clustering to satisfy. Um, this is always a good way of trying to get at what is a good definition of clustering. So we're gonna to try to partition our set and we wanna somehow use the metric or dissimilarity measure. Um, and we really like the following implication to hold. Um, so again, reading this notation, which might be a little, uh, little confusing to people who haven't taken more classes which rely on uh, set theory notation. 
This says that for every xi and xj inside of C alpha, so that means whenever I've got two points that belong to the same cluster or two samples that belong to the same cluster, I want the distance or the dissimilarity between them to be much less than the minimum distance between those points and points in other clusters. So this is uh, xk inside of C beta where I range over all beta that are not equal to alpha. So essentially I've got my, my, my clusters. I'm gonna pick two points that I think belong to the same one. And I'm gonna say that their distance or this, their similarity, they're much more similar to points that are in other clusters. So in other words, things in the same cluster should be much more similar to each other than they are to things in other clusters. Now, checking this condition you know, via sort of brute force can be very, very complicated because you have to basically choose all possible pairs of points um, and then perform all these different comparisons. Uh, so we're at least going at, at something like n squared computations, which for really large data sets can, it's not, not feasible. Um, so we're gonna need to come up with different ways of approximating this notion. So one way in which we could try to simplify uh, this notion um, is to introduce a quantity known as variability. So the basic concept behind variability is we, we say we have some proposed clustering. Um, so this is our partition of our data set into some, some clusters C alpha. And so for each cluster, what I'm gonna do is take what I call the the mean, geometric mean or, or vector mean, sometimes called the centroid of that cluster. And it's written by a C alpha bar. So you'll remember in our quick review probability and stats lectures, I have this X bar, uh, which is sort of our empirical mean of a sample. Here's pretty similar. Uh, all you do is you take all the elements in your, in your cluster. And again, you wanna think of these as vectors. Um, you add them all up. So that means I take entry-wise the sum of these vectors, and then I just divide by the number of elements in that cluster. So this is gonna give me a notion of a, of a geometric mean or vector mean. And so what I'm gonna ask now is that the, the distance from my mean, when I square that, that is gonna be my variability within a cluster. And so the idea is that, you know, if we had a bunch of points tightly concentrated around the mean, there would be low variability. But if points are sort of more diffuse and spread out, um, there'd be higher variability. Uh, this should look a lot like variance for you. So how are you gonna use variability as a, as a sort of penalty function for phrasing op some of our optimization problems? And remember, we used a penalty function in this sort of train model predict paradigm. Uh, so essentially, we're going to keep refining our, our modeling step um, in a way that hopefully reduces our penalty function or maybe maximizes some other function that we like. And we want to have a way of sort of updating this. So for clustering, um, one way in which we can, we can phrase this, uh, this penalty function is to use the, the dissimilarity of our clustering. So be careful, we now have sort of two note, the word dissimilarity being used in two different contexts. Um, and, th and this is in, in our book, uh, Introduction to Computation and Programming Using Python uh, by Guttag. And so basically what we do um, in this setting is we're gonna define a function associated to every possible clustering um, called DC. And DC basically tells us how dissimilar is our, is our clustering scheme. And that just basically sums up this variability within a cluster across each of our clusters. So in theory, our ideal clustering scheme would be, would be one that minimized DC across all possible partitions. So let's try to think about that a little bit more. So I've got this function. D of C, 
DFC essentially assigns to every possible partition of my set X um, a number. And it's a non-negative number because I'm summing a bunch of things that are squared. And I just said that ideally what we could do is toggle our partition in such a way that we would minimize this dissimilarity. Uh, that would somehow be our, our optimal clustering solution. But I want you to sit and think about this, um, this function and think about all the possible ways in which you could uh, partition your set. Go ahead and give yourself maybe a few minutes just to sit and think about it. I encourage you to go ahead and pause the video. So if you need a little more time or a little another hint, notice that question two asks, what happens if you fix the number of clusters to be K? Um, so that means that you're going to partition your set X into K subsets that are non-overlapping, but include all the points in X. The reason I bring this up is because this function here, D of C, actually has a minimum value of zero. If you partition every point into its own cluster, so that means if my set X has n elements in it, I'm going to partition uh, C into the full n elements there. Now, this isn't a very good clustering. It essentially says that every sample is unique, um, although there's maybe sort of a poetry to that. Um, doesn't really get at the tasks that we're trying to do. We're trying to clump things that are similar. And let's be honest, some things are a lot more similar than they are different. Uh, so this isn't a really well-posed problem if we allow the number of clusters to vary, but it becomes the well-posed problem if we fix the number of clusters ahead of time. And, the, and that is essentially where the K comes from and K means. You know, we're gonna pick ahead of time the number of clusters to be K, and then we're going to um, try to minimize this function. So this is an example of what's called a constrained optimization problem. So this is essentially, we're going to optimize our function, but subject to the constraint that the number of sets in our partition equals k. So this motivates k-means. This is a clustering algorithm that has two inputs. We have some data set inside some feature vector space. Um, and again, we're going to go ahead and use that property that this is a metric space. Um, and then we're going to choose some metric on on this vector space. So vector space allows us to add points um, together, uh, but then we can still use our metric or our dissimilarity measure. Um, and of course, we outlined several in uh, two lectures ago. And then of course, uh, this capital K corresponds to this little K here. We're going to pick some integer, which is going to be the number of clusters. So the output of this algorithm, so that's our input, data set and a choice of K. Um, the output is going to be a partition into k subsets um, where a point xi is in cluster c alpha if and only if xi is closer to the mean of c alpha than it is to the mean of any other cluster again mean here means that i've you know done this operation where i've summed up all the points and then divided by uh, the number of points in that cluster so said using symbols, x i is in c alpha if and only if. That's what that backwards and front uh, left and right pointing arrow is. If and only if the distance from x i to the mean that it supposedly belongs to in terms of its cluster is less than or equal to the minimum of the distances from x i to the mean of any other cluster. And then we additionally require that uh, this particular function minimizes this penalty function among all other partitions, C prime of X into K clusters. So this is gonna be the, the real key that we're gonna look at first. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and look, at, um, look at some examples. So we're gonna start with just three points um, inside of 
R1. Um, so this is this means we have just a single scalar value associated to every sample. Um, and we're using that to go ahead and plot its location of the sample on the real line. So let's imagine we've got three points. So obviously, if I wanted to cluster this into two things, which comes from k equals two, we can already see in our mind's eye that these guys should belong in one cluster and this one should belong to another. But again, the whole point of machine learning is that we wanna teach computers to do things that we think is obvious so that we don't have to do it ourselves. And in fact, they can then do it in situations that's much harder to determine or visualize. So we've got our three points um, featured by a single number on the real line. And let's just go ahead and randomly choose some, uh, some clusters. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna let you be part of cluster one. This is gonna be part of cluster two, and this is gonna be part of cluster one. So we need to first compute the, the geometric mean or the vector mean associated to each of these clusters. So obviously if I've got a cluster with just a single point, its mean is equal to itself. There's nothing to add to it um, to, to get something interesting. But if I take C1, um, here the mean is represented by the midpoint between those two values. And so now the question is, does this clustering satisfy the two requirements uh, we just listed? In particular, does it satisfy this requirement that a point has to be closest to its own cluster rather than any other one? I should say, is a point closest to its cluster's mean than it is closer to other clusters' means? Excuse me. So clearly the answer is no, because if we look at X3, X3 is actually closer to the mean of C2, which is just this one point X2. So it's closer to here than it is to here. And again, our rule was that an element X3 is an element of C1, if and only if uh, the distance from X3 to the mean of C1, which is this green star, is less than the distance to the mean of C2. So that's no good. So let's go ahead and, and just flip those two. So let's imagine we now call this to be element of C1 and this one to be an element of C2. Now, is this a valid clustering? I mean, does it satisfy that first requirement? The answer is still no. Um, X2 here is closer to the mean of C2 still, because that's just now X3 is that element of C2. So the, this distance, distance from this point to this mean, which is the mean of a different cluster, is less than the distance from here to here. Now, of course, if we uh, move this over a little bit, uh, we'd start to get into sort of a tie break scenario. So eventually we need to flip um, this one more time. So if I put these two in a cluster and I see that, ah, yes, finally, each of these points is closer to its mean, which is its midpoint here, than it is to the mean of any other cluster, meaning closer to that, that other point. So you can get a sense how you might iterate your choice of clustering um, in order to eventually converge on a situation where this uh, proximity to its cluster's mean uh, condition is satisfied. So just some points to, to be aware of. So often getting a really precise solution to this uh, is still computationally difficult. And so you'll hear the terminology of invoking what's called a greedy algorithm approximation. So essentially what we need to do is provide some sort of update rule, which um, gets us closer to minimizing this variability function or this dissimilarity function. Um, and does it in such a way that sort of decreases the function most rapidly. This is what's called uh, a greedy algorithm. And of course this concept appears uh, in all sorts of parts of computer science and really in life. So just remember, here's the sort of definition of a greedy algorithm. It's one that chooses the locally optimal solution at each step, even if it need not be globally optimal. And when I teach this class in person, I often try to pause and ask people to reflect 
what are some examples of sort of sequences of locally optimal choices that don't necessarily lead one to a globally optimal solution? For me, some of the examples I like to think of most concern the environment. Um, clearly, we throughout time have been motivated by uh, just doing whatever is easiest, um, you know, chopping down the tree that's right there to help you know heat our homes. Uh, but often we don't take a sort of global perspective, which says that if we keep doing that, maybe that's not the right thing uh, to maximize our happiness over a longer time. Uh, I'll leave it to you to think about some more examples of this for yourself. All right, so now let's finally get to uh, what's called a greedy approximation to solving this k-means problem, which I phrase as an optimization problem. Um, and so here's going to be an algorithm which actually gets us at least close to that ideal solution, um, although there are times where it's going to get stuck um, and not actually converge on the globally optimal solution. So here we go. So one way to do this, <clears throat> and I'm going to switch from the language of mean or vector mean to centroid, just realize those are synonyms. They mean the same thing. So first what I'm going to do is I take my data set and I'm just going to go ahead and randomly assign uh, a number one through K. These are going to be my sort of cluster labels to each of the elements in this data set. And there are various ways in which you might want to make sure that you at least use all of the one through K so that you actually have K items. Um, um, but that's a de implementation detail. So once you've randomly assigned uh, these sort of class labels or cluster labels. Um, you can now repeat the following observations. So you're going to take all the points that have label one. And again, you think of these as sitting inside of a vector space. Um, and you're going to compute the centroid, so the vector mean of all the points labeled one. So that's going to give you some point. And now do this for all the class labels. So. So you take all the points labeled two, compute its mean centroid, all the points labeled three, compute its mean centroid, all the way up through K. Now, we're going to check for each element of our data set. Now we pick a point and then we're gonna ask, all right, which centroid is closest? So remember I initially assigned it some class label and I've also computed a centroid for that class label. But just as we saw in the previous example, there might be situations where there's some other class label centroid that it's closer to. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is change the label of that point so that that element now has the label of the closest centroid to it. And so now I'm gonna do this uh, for all these points. And so this is gonna cause sort of a shuffle of class labels. And now I can repeat this algorithm. I can do the same thing where I compute the centroids and then I go through each point and I ask which, uh, which class is centroid are you closest to? That's gonna be your new class label. And then I'm gonna keep iterating this until the set of centroids uh, stops changing. So that's gonna essentially check that I've now reached something where I can't update or if I try to follow this label, there's not gonna be any, any change. Um, so once the centroid is the same, I stop this algorithm. So let's go ahead and just look at this example. And, I, and again, I think this is from this book by, uh, by James Witten, Hasty, and uh, Tib Sharani. So imagine I've got this data here. I've got this sort of blob of points here, and I've got a second blob of points here. Um, but I'm actually going to pretend that there are secretly three clusters in here. So this is why I have k equals 3. So step one, I randomly color my points. I'm going to use color as a proxy for class label, uh, green, orange, and uh, purple, fuchsia. So I just randomly color each of these points. And it, this being sort of random, which to be precise probably means something more like uniformly random, um, you ideally won't have really good separation, um, which means that uh, the centroids of all the green points indicated by this green disk here, uh, it's going to be pretty close to the centroid of all the, the fuchsia points, which is indicated by this disk here, which is going to be pretty close to the centroid of all the orange points. You can just see that there's slightly more orange points over here. So then this centroid is sort of dragged 
closer in that direction, but they're all pretty close. Um, but nevertheless, this, this slight imbalance um, is then gonna mean that all the points that are slightly closer to this orange disk, I'm gonna relabel as orange in my, in my next uh, step, step 2b. So again, I haven't changed the centroids yet. I'm still remembering the centroids from the old assignment. I just remember these are gonna be all my orange points. These are gonna now be all my purple points and these are gonna be all my green points. All right, now if I compute uh, the centroids for these, well, suddenly they're gonna fly off in different directions because I've now gone ahead and used these slight imbalances in the location of the centroid to uh, suddenly reshuffle all my class labels. So now I've got all the fuchsia points over here, all the green points over here, and all the orange points over here. So now their centroids are very well separated. Um, but, but nevertheless, there's still gonna be a few borderline cases, such as like, if you look at these two points here, uh, currently labeled orange, uh, that's because they were closer to this orange center um, than it was to this green center. But now that we've relabeled all these points, um, see that they're actually slightly closer to the green cluster. So in the next iteration, you'll see that they flip uh, from orange to green. And then, uh, and then similarly here, this, uh, this orange point here flips to fuchsia. And essentially this should now be a, a sort of fixed point. So I mean, if I go through and I ask again, all right, which point am I closest to? No, no point's gonna change its assignment. So that was one implementation where I go ahead and I randomly assign uh, points to, uh, to, class, uh, to classes. But I could have also sort of dualized this process. Um, and, uh, and again, in our, in our Guttag book and also our Jake von der Plas uh, uh, Python data science handbook, um, they use a slightly different uh, implementation, uh, which actually has some appeal to it. Um, so here what they do is they just Say, all right, if I'm gonna have K points, um, and that means eventually I'm gonna have K centroids, let me just go ahead and randomly guess what my K centroids are gonna be. So you just start by guessing cluster centers. So you think, 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 you're gonna be a cluster center, you're gonna be a cluster center, you're gonna be a cluster center. And then now you essentially repeat the latter two stages. Um, so now you just assign points to the nearest cluster, and then you, you're gonna sort of iterate this process uh, um, in, in such a way that you then change uh, change points so that they end up being uh, uh, closer to uh, to their their true clusters. Because again, just because you're closest doesn't necessarily mean that's that point is going to actually be the mean of the things that's closest, and we'll we'll see see that soon. Um, just some language here, I and mean, this goes beyond the scope of this course. Uh, sometimes called the expectation step, E step. Um, and this also goes to the sort of M is referred to this maximization step. So this is this is kind of like the, the greedy step in this algorithm. Um, I notice they just set the cluster centers to the mean, or perhaps uh, 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 perhaps they go ahead and uh, pick a point. But here it doesn't actually look like you need to pick a point in your data set to be your mean. Okay. So if we follow this slightly different implementation. So here we just can kind of randomly pick uh, four points, assuming we're gonna go for k equals four, or k equals three. So similarly, if you know, I call this my blue, my blue center, my green center, my purple center, my yellow center, suddenly all these points are gonna be blue, green, yellow, purple. And now if I go through this M step, so now what I need to do is I need to compute the actual mean of all the blue points. And you can see that um, you, can, you want to think of the mean as sort of the center of gravity. Um, and that causes the center to move towards the actual uh, center of all the blue points. Um, and then you can sort of repeat this process of like, okay, uh, now these points, which were previously labeled blue, uh, they're actually closer to, to yellow. So notice this actually grows the number of points in the yellow yellow cluster. So this is again our, our expectation step, or what we'd expect a, a points uh, cluster label to be if, uh, if that were the mean. But then again, we're gonna, once we've done the shuffling, go through and, and recompute uh, who belongs to what. 
and you'll you'll sort of stare carefully and see that some values change, um, but eventually it settles again on some final cluster and where things don't change. So this notion of like things not changing, especially in sort of a, a rule that iterates, um, sometimes called a fixed point in mathematics. Um, so in this sense, uh, the k-means algorithm is is trying to give an algorithm that finds a fixed point amongst the set of all possible clusterings or partition. Um, and so essentially that means that you know, right now we've got a rule for changing the clustering, but we're looking to reach a point where it no longer changes again. So if A is our algorithm that takes in a clustering and produces another clustering, you can think of k-means as being a fixed point or the k-means clustering to be a fixed point of this algorithm, i.e. When you take in a clustering, you apply the algorithm, you get the same clustering back, A of C equals C. This connects with all sorts of beautiful things in mathematics, differential equations, just topology, and so on and so forth. So there's another comment I want to make. Um, so we had this notion of what's closest to what. Um, so whenever we pick these, these centroids, these CI, um, and this sort of goes with the, the second implementation perspective, where you pick your centroids first, um, and assuming we're in, in sort of a, again, nice, nice space like uh, Euclidean space, um, R2, for example, um, you, can, you can then ask, well, what is the region of points that's closest to a given point and no other? Uh, this is sometimes called a Voronoi cell decomposition. And of course, this depends on the metric, how you're measuring distance. And so if you're using Euclidean distance and you put down these little black points here, um, you then get to a situation where uh, this is the region of points that's closest to that point than any other. You'll notice that there are these long flares um, and that they also kind of lie across these sort of perpendicular bisectors when you take a vector from here to here. Um, and then they run into these interesting angles. So all this is to say is that in geometry, especially computational geometry, there's this notion of a Bournoy cell decomposition, which essentially is defined as the decomposition of your space into regions so that each point is closest to some point than to any other. And you usually pick these ahead of time, again, finitely many. Um, now, Manhattan distance, that's going to radically change this notion of proximity. And so I just leave it to you to think about uh, what are sort of aspects that you think would be more carefully uh, tracked here. And again, Manhattan distance uses this idea of distance driving along a grid. So maybe it does make sense for neighborhoods that have sort of a, a center post to be defined in this way rather than one of these other ways. All right, so we've gone through um, sort of broader philosophical context for clustering. We've gone through some of the optimization and math parts of clustering. Let's finally get down to the code. Let's get to the Python here. Um, and again, I'm going to recommend you uh, you look up Jake van der Plaas's uh, uh, in-depth exploration of k-means clustering. It's really fantastic. And it's where I borrowed some of these figures from. So again, from, from Jake van der Plaas's uh, uh, notebook here. So, so this is just a general make blobs um, function, which allows you to sort of simulate um, data where you have some noisy notion of clusters. And you, you, you can go ahead and specify ahead of time uh, what you want the centers to be, how many are there. This is going to allow you to also uh, choose, ideally, what your value of k is going to be, since you need to kind of know ahead of time how many clusters you think they're going to be. This is one of the big downfalls of k-means. Um, all right, so again, from scikit-learn, there's the k-means algorithm. Uh, and just like in our object-oriented programming perspective, uh, we can call an instance of this k-means object where the number of clusters is four. Um, and then we fit on our data. X, if you'll remember, is going to come from uh, this function here. So where I've made blobs, and then y true is going to give us our true class label, um, or cluster label, I should say. And then uh, here we go ahead and plot um, the x and y coordinates of each of these x points. Um, 
and I'm going to label them according to the predicted cluster label that my k-means algorithm provides. Um, and the color map here is just you know meant to be appealing. And so here additionally I can extract what the centers are from this k-means um, algorithm by using this this attribute dot cluster centers. I get be careful with these underscores. Um, they actually have meaning. All right, so let's go through maybe uh, our own in-house implementation of, of what k-means looks like. Um, and, and here we're going to just make use of already a built-in function um, that's called pairwise distances argmen. So this basically finds the point that is closest to you. Uh, and so here we've, we've written a function, find clusters. Uh, you're taking a data set X, number of clusters you're looking for, and because <clears throat> we're going to do this process where we randomly assign uh, centers, it's going to be useful to have control over our randomness. So we do this by changing our random seed. So as the comments indicate here, we're going to randomly choose our clusters. Um, and we'll go through exactly what this means. Um, but you can see here I create sort of a random object, RNG, um, that has that specified random seed. Um, that's two is our default value. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through some permutation up to the number of clusters. I'm going to pull out some essentially sample labels. Um, these are the things that index the points in this NumPy array, X. And then I'm just going to choose my centers to be those I points. Um, well, it ends up being the number of clusters points, but indexed by this label I. And now I have my while loop. Um, and here I've exactly got my 2a, 2b, and then 2c, which checks whether or not I've reached my fixed point. Um, so first thing I do is I'm going to let my labels be those which have minimum distance um, in x to our centers. And then I have essentially a very nice way of going ahead and checking for all the points that have my uh, were label equals i, um, and those are sort of our i points here. Um, and I'm going to use that to then compute these new centers. Um, so notice here I have to use this dot mean uh, function or method. Uh, and essentially here I'm again using list comprehension, but wrapped inside of uh, uh, my uh, my numpy array. Okay, so then this goes through, it finds all the points that are given label, looks at their mean, and then um, that's going to be my new centers. And then it asks, are my new centers the same as my previous centers? If so, I break, you know, exit this while loop, which will run forever because I've said while true. Um, and then at the end of the day, I've gone ahead and reassigned centers to be my new centers. Um, and eventually, when this while loop's done, I return centers and those labels. So you can see that when I when I run this algorithm here um, with my make blobs x with four, I, I've gone ahead and, and produced these things. I could have also changed this to be to be three, where I'm only allowing three clusters, and it's decided that this middle two blobs are part of one cluster and these other ones are. Could have also made this into two. And so it, it thinks this belongs in a special cluster and this belongs to a different one. Um, but let's go ahead and go back to that four, which we know is actually the true clustering because that's how our make blobs function was, was called. All right, so I'm gonna encourage you to sit and really try to understand that code in, in greater detail. Um, so in particular, what happens in this in this setting here? And if you ever you ever need to sort of debug or figure out what's going on, um, you just go ahead and take the code out and sort of copy it into a cell and just see what happens there. So, so notice that when I do x shape zero, I get I get three hundred. But what does even x shape do? Okay, so this now makes sense because 
uh, if I go back through, I see I actually made 300 points um, and there were X and Y coordinates. Um, that's what that two is and 300 is my number of samples. Again, this is being returned as a tuple. So when I uh, do this, just going ahead and I'm extracting um, uh, that first entry in my tuple, which essentially says what's the number of uh, points in my, in my sample, 300. So instead of doing RNG, I'm just gonna create my own random object, which I'm gonna call rando. Um, and here they specified what the random seed should be. Um, it should be two, I'll call it two. You could also call it 42, doesn't really matter. That doesn't really do anything, but if I do this now, and you can see how what this rando object does when I call this permutation method and I'm using it on the numbers zero through 300, um, or I should say one through 100 or 300, um, it then permutes it. And then this operation right here slices the first four entries. Um, and notice if I, if I chose you know, two as my random seed, I'd get different uh, centers. If I do 42, I get those centers. All this is to say is that these are our four initial guesses for our, uh, our centers in this implementation of k-means. All right, and similarly here, you can imagine what, ask yourself, what is what's happening here? Now you just need to sort of figure out what's going on with this mean method. Um, so here I've gone ahead and provided a sort of simpler array. We could try to explore what this method does. Um, and so, so here I have a NumPy array where it's a list of lists. We have one, two, three, four. I'm going to think of those as my first row vector, my second row vector. So this kind of looks like a matrix. Um, when I take just the mean of this numpy uh, of this numpy array, it adds up all the elements and produces a single number. Um, notice that one plus two plus three plus four is ten. Um, so four plus three is seven, and two plus one is three. And you divide by four, it gives you two point five. Um, now, if I choose different axes, um, then I can uh, go through and and then try to understand. All right, with axis equals zero, what does that do? Ah, well, here I'm essentially taking the mean across a column. So, because one and three, their average is two, and two and four, their average is three. And then I've got, if I try to do the other way, so I take the mean uh, across rows, 1.5 is the mean of one and two, and 3.5 is the mean of three and four. And then you know you can just go through here because again what this does is actually takes uh, my zero here. So essentially all that's happening um, is when I take these uh, these sort of new centers, um, what I'm doing is now essentially long axis zero, which means I'm taking my collection of points, which is viewed as a bunch of x comma y uh, in a row. And then my samples are indexed by row element elements filling out this column. And so then what I'm doing is I'm taking the mean of all the x coordinates and the mean of all the y coordinates, which is exactly uh, how the centroid is computed. So effectively, what's happening here is I'm computing the, uh, the centroid of all the points with a given label i. And that's how I'm computing my new centers. So, I made this allusion to the fact that all this is is really a greedy approximation to the, the sort of platonic ideal of a k-means algorithm. Uh, and in particular, because we've got this ability to change the random seed, uh, sometimes we'll get stuck in, in local optima. So notice, even when I call my k-means algorithm with four clusters, but because I, I happen to choose a very unlucky set of points as my centers. It then puts all of these points in a green cluster, all these points in a purple cluster. Here's in sort of my blue cyan, and then this is my yellow. Obviously, because we have the benefit of sight, we can tell that this is not the correct clustering. And if I just change this, I'll get back into one of my other ones. <clears throat> 
All these other random seeds seem to be doing just fine. Ah, but random seed three doesn't do well either. So I'll go back to zero and then say try one, two, and three for our seed. So that's an example of a local, not global optimum, because obviously I can find another clustering that has less variability. Okay, so that's it for today. But I want to leave you with another thought. Um, and this will be one of our projects that we do in this class. Um, so the process of clustering is something that you all have also seen in much more immediate circumstances. And this comes to the problem of grades. What happens when we're trying to assign a grade is we're trying to prescribe clusterings of, uh, these are all the A students, these are all the B students, these are all the C students, these are all the D students. Um, and notice that this really matches the definition of a partition. You can't have two grades, you can't have both an A and a B. You, you have one grade and every student gets a grade. Um, and so, I'm going to give you some real data where a professor assigned these grades. Uh, and if we forget about the decorations, pluses or minuses, this means we're essentially, they're doing a clustering test with a number of clusters is five, corresponding to A, B, C, D, and F. Um, so what happens if instead of letting a human grade, you let the k-means algorithm grade, where the, the score was essentially your final grade? Uh, so this would correspond again to a clustering along uh, one line or in one dimension. And we could also refine this problem. So what happens if I include pluses or minuses? Um, of course, there's no F minus. Um, it's all just, just F. So, so we end up getting uh, basically three times four um, plus one, 13 possible grades. And so, we can then treat this as a problem where one professor did one thing with the k-means algorithm do another, and we can see to what extent does k-means and a professor agree. Um, you'll have access to that uh, on our server soon enough. All right, thank you for uh, listening to this somewhat lengthy lecture. I look forward to seeing you in class soon.